So, hi everyone. Uh, as Robert said, I'm Swizzets, I'm Googleable. Don't do that right now, because you're here to see cool stuff first. Um, I was gonna say, so everything you're gonna see in this presentation, hey, that way it doesn't shine into my eyes. Everything you're gonna see in this presentation was is a video, and I think I'm gonna show you the live demo version on, at the end, but everything was built with React and D3, and it's mostly animations and cool stuff because just static charts don't look as cool on a presentation. Um, so, first things first. Who here knows that if you call yourself a software engineer, you make $20,000 more per year than if you call yourself a software developer? Wow, not a lot of people. So, that's the first thing I found out when I was playing around with React and D3 because that was the data set I had. Um, <laughs> So, D3 is great, right? Everyone here loves D3. This is a D3 meetup, right? Who loves D3? Hands up. Perfect. We all love D3. And there's nothing actually wrong with D3. It's a great library. It does everything you need. It's like, why the hell would you use React? Why would you make this thing even more complicated than it already is? I know that when I started learning D3, I like found an example online and I had no idea what's going on. It's, it's like impossible to learn this thing from scratch. So let's add React, let's make it even more complicated. But why? The thing is, the reason you wanna add React is the same reason you would wanna add React to anything else. Who here has tried React yet? A Couple of people, wow, a lot of people. So, you already know, for everybody else's benefit, the reason you wanna use React in any sort of front-end JavaScript project is that it gives you this thing called componentization, which is sort of related to the concept of functional programming, but it looks like object programming and it's not actually functional programming because JavaScript doesn't actually have that, um, which is a mouthful way of saying it's really cool and you wanna use it. Um, it makes it easier to test and debug your code which I'm gonna talk about later. It gives you fancy diffing algorithms, whatever that is, and it gives you hot loading, which is amazing. Um, so the benefits of componentization, this is really, it's kind of the main thing that React gives you, and everything else stems from componentization. It's, uh, it's everything else is really just a side effect of, the co of componentization. And what is, what is componentization? The basic idea behind everything you write with React and hopefully modern, modern coding standards that we're all following and all of our code is obviously perfect when we write it the first time. Um, the idea is that you have your code split into understandable chunks that you can think about independently. Ideally, if I give you a component that is, say, a button, that component will always act as a button. You can put it anywhere on your page and it's a button. You can render it on a server and it's a button. You can render it on like a phone and it's still a button and it always behaves the same. It doesn't care about what you do with it, where you put it, it's a button. And uh, I, had, I was going somewhere with that. Basically the idea is that if you have a component, you can look at that component, develop the component, make sure that it's the perfect button, that it's the best button in the world, and then everybody else can use it as a button and they don't have to care about the internals. They don't have to understand how you implemented this. And this is especially important if you're working in a team because you can close people off in their component and you don't have to worry about juniors messing up your code because your code is obviously better than somebody, than somebody else's. Um, so here's an example of transitions. This is, I think this is a relatively famous example that Mike Bostock once implemented to make an example of enter-exit update transitions, except that this one is built with React. And the cool thing about this one is that I didn't have to do the whole enter-exit stuff. All I had to do was say, hey, you know what? I want a list of letters. It's a, uh, I'm rendering this thing, and I don't know what it is, but I have an array that's full of letters, and for every letter in this array, I want to render a letter. And this is, this is really the core of everything you do when you're doing React and D3 together, is you have these components that are like data small tiny data visualizations that render 
one thing or like one part of your visualization and you just loop through the data and say how mu however much data I have, print those components and then React kind of takes care of everything else. Um, and to prove that point, to make that whole alphabet animated. So this renders an alphabet. To make it animated, you render a new alphabet every second and a half. And that's it. You just say, hey, I have a new alphabet. And you store it inside your alphabet component. You say, you now have new data. And that's it. It becomes animated and it looks like this. That's like that's the core of it. You have an alphabet component. You say I want to I want to render render random letters. You change which random letters they are every second and a half, and it becomes animated and awesome. And it does all of these transitions, and you don't have to worry about things like what is a new letter, what's an old letter, how do I remove them, what do I do with them, and things like that. And I'll show you a bit more about the specifics of how that's implemented later, but that's the gist of it. Data, render it. Um, I thought I had a slide in between here. So when, one cool result of this is that you also get reusability. Take, for instance, this helpful chart of software salary distributions, which has terrible labels because act labels are hard, but what you can see is that it's four histograms. If you look at all, all software salaries, they all kind of skew to the bottom. If you look at engineers, they kind of have a, I guess it could be a bimodal distribution, but it's more spread out. They have higher salaries. Programmers have high-ish salaries, and developers have crappy salaries. Um, I don't know why this is. This is just what the data says. I don't really have a theory for why engineers get paid more than developers because, as we all know, their jobs are the same. Um, so the way this was rendered is you just say, hey, I want four histograms. Um, and this is what I think is really cool. This is a cool thing about having components and then what follows from it is declarative data visualization. And I know. Everybody says, hey, D3 is declarative. You don't have to, like, so first of all, what is declarative? Declarative means that you, you don't sell, tell the computer how to render something. You just say what you want. And the idea is, once you have a histogram component, you don't have to say, this is how a histogram works. You just say, give me a histogram, and then give me another histogram, and another histogram. And you get four histograms, which I kind of blurred out the parameters they get, but essentially it's always a histogram component with some data and some parameters like x, y position, how to get the value out of it. And I think we all know about value accessors because D3 is kind of based on them. Um, a title and so on, and it, renders, and it renders this thing, which is basically the slide that I accidentally showed you. What you get is structure at a glance. Because you have components, because you have this declarativeness that works at a higher level than just uh, rectangles and small things. It works at the level of entire charts, entire visualizations. You get this structure at a glance where you can immediately see that this is for histograms. Or in this case, this is a pie chart. Who here can tell me that this is a pie chart just by looking at the code? This is, by the way, an official example from D3's website for rendering a pie chart. And I mean, I've, I've wrote two books about this, and unless I look really, really hard at this and try to really understand it line by line, I would never guess that this is a pie chart. And this is the actual code, by the way, that renders it. You have something like select all arcs and then fit in a pie and then append graphs, and like, what the hell is going on? This is not declarative. You're like, for everything you want to do, you're essentially putting together these SVG elements as if you were writing jQuery or something like that. And essentially, I think that's what D3 is. It's like jQuery for SVG, jQuery for data visualization, which is fine. It's just that, you know, it's like 2016. We might want something a bit better than that, something that's easier to use. Um, and this, for example, is a pie chart in React with D3, which, yes, it's still a lot of code, but I think it's slightly easier here to see what makes a pie chart. It's like, 
you go through a data set and you render labeled arcs. And a labeled arc is something that renders text and super dot render, which is really not, not the script. Um, but you can see that a labeled arc is essentially an arc with a label. And what you get is, I hope there's an example on the next page. It's not, there's not. This was supposed to be a pie chart. Um, but the idea is that if you look at the code, it's somewhat easy, easy to see what's going on. You can, like, on a higher level, you would have a component called pie chart, and then if you open that component, you would see that it's built out of labeled arcs, and then if you go into a labeled arc, you would see that it's an arc with a label, and you get, like, of course, if the more you go into detail, the less declarative code looks, and I think that's how it always turns out to be. But if you design your components well, then you get this happy situation where you can just say, hey, give me histograms, and you get histograms, which I think is great. Um, what's the next thing? So you get, comp so componentization is a great result of, it's a core concept of React, really. And one of the benefits of that is that you have better testing and debugging, which I am apparently not going to go into detail of because it's kind of a long topic. Um, but I think we can all agree that if you can focus on small pieces of code at a time, it's a lot easier to reason about what that code is doing, especially if you follow proper React principles where your code, like each component is supposed to be like an immutable fancy function that is, uh, I forget the, the word, it's something like referential transparency is I think the buzzword. Is anyone here a functional programmer? Wow, no functional programmers. And the, your favorite library was written by a PhD. Um, basically the idea is that components rely only on their immediate inputs instead of on state or on global state or anything like that. So when you say render a component with a certain parameters, it, you always get the same thing back. If you call it multiple times, you still get the same thing back. There's nothing inside the component that would affect what that component does that you can't see directly when you're calling the component. So it's a bit like calling a function, and it's very much unlike calling anything in D3, because I think pretty much everything in D3 is like an object with internal state. I Personally, I haven't found anything that doesn't work that way, because people who design D3 are, they really like this concept of having f objects where you then have getters and setters that change the internal state of the object. And the result of that is that it's really hard to debug and test because the more times you call your code, it starts acting differently. If you put it in a different situation, it starts acting differently. And with React, unless you really mess up, that is not the case. You always know what you're getting from the call point. You can look at the code and you know exactly what's going to happen. Which brings us to the next thing. Because you have this, these referentially transparent, immutable components, blah, 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 you get fancy diffing algorithms. Who here has played Doom? Perfect. This was my favorite game when I was in like sixth grade or something like that. And the cool thing about this game is that the same guy who wrote this game wrote a paper that React's uh, diffing algorithms are based on. He, he's called Carmack and he's pretty smart. Mm. And I think he still codes actually. He's not just doing spacecraft. Um, so the cool thing about having these immutable components is that you have uh, the concept of, you can do, what you can do is you can change and forget. So what that means is you, have, you can have a data structure that represents your entire application, like the state of, not the state, the, re how should I phrase this? So what you see on the screen is always state. Like the, the final output has to be state because otherwise you can't render it. You can have an internal data representation of that state and then what you can do is you can just mutate that data structure and React will handle everything about rendering that, those mutations on the screen. Um, 
Later I'm going to show you an example of, I, of how I use that to make a simple game, simple browser game. But the idea is that you can, this is, the, this is the basic browser game. So what's going on here is I have essentially a huge, a huge tree of data that holds the position of every Space Invader, the position of every um, bullet of, ev of the player. Everything is a position in like a data structure. And then all I have to do is when something happens, when there's an event, I change a value in that data structure and React is, and then what happens is React's code somewhere deep down in the bowels of React goes, oh hey, that thing changed. And then, it, then it tells the, the main component, yo, your data is different now, you should re-render. And then that component pushes via, uses props to push the new data down to children components. And everything gets updated without me having to think about it. And, um, React, and basically what also happens is I don't have to think about those re-renders. I can just keep changing my data 60 times a second to get animation. Even the drag and drop of the, of the player is done by detecting where the mouse is and changing the X and Y position of the player. I'm not actually detecting any drag events. It's just when you put your mouse down, I start tracking mouse position, and every time I have a new mouse position, I just change the mem memory state of where the player should be rendered, and then it gets rendered in a new place. And because that happens 60 times a second, you think you're dragging the, the rectangle around, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but the point is, I don't have to think about those re-renders. They happen automatically, and they are fast enough because React knows which components have actually changed. It doesn't have to throw away everything. It can only re-render the, the components whose props actually change, like whose properties are now different. Only those got, get re-rendered in the DOM. Everything else stays exactly where it is. Now, because of how this game works, that means every component gets moved every time. Question? Yeah, how much does this scale? Is this stuff like, yeah, 150,000 bullets? Uh, that is a very rough question. <laughs> um, I've tested it like after about I think three or four thousand DOM elements, SVG becomes a problem, but the internal state still works well, and the diffing still works. And I think that if I wasn't trying to actually change five thousand elements, it would work a lot better than if you're re literally changing everything every time. The idea is that React is smart enough to render only things that change, which can work for you or against you, depending on what you're doing. Yeah? How do you handle the nonsense without it being reversed? I use, so D3 has this thing called D3.mouse, which gives you the current position of the mouse. So I, ha I already have a game loop running 60 times a second. And in that game loop, I can check where is the, is the mouse, am I currently tracking the mouse? So there's a Boolean flag for, button, button hel being held down. I use D3 mouse inside the game loop to check for the position and then I change stuff. That's roughly how it works. And it works pretty well. And then another, another result of having this diffing algorithm and all of this stuff are the lifecycle methods. So if you look at the, uh, the alphabet I showed you earlier, with that React transition group, which is, isn't that important right now, the point is you get lifecycle components. So in your component, lifecycle methods, in your component you can define callbacks for certain events that happen in the lifecycle of a component. So in this case, to do those enter, update, exit transitions, the components themselves, like each letter itself, took care of that. It's like, oh hey, you're now gonna be put into the screen, into the page, and you can do something, you can transition it, and then you say, okay, I'm now done being put into the, into the page. And using these, these um, lifecycle methods, in the case of transitions, what you can do is you can, you can get self-contained transitions. So the parent component doesn't have to think about how each letter is animated. All it has to do is say, I have new letters, or I'm taking letters out. And then each letter on its own knows, oh, hey, I'm being taken out, I should do this first before I allow to be destroyed from the DOM or 
Yes, question. Inside the, um, so there are different concepts of there are two different concepts of how you can do animations. You can use either transitions, which in this case I used pure D3 transitions, where I use D3 to directly change the DOM, and then when I'm done changing the DOM with D3, I call the callback and say and tell React, okay, I am now rendered an incorrect position. But you can also, if you have the game loop approach, then you wouldn't use these transitions and you wouldn't use the lifecycle methods really. Because then you're using the actual changes of the values as animation. Um, basically, the difference is whether you, you want to be high level and you want to have simple stuff that you're not thinking about or you want to have low level, detail, low level control of how you do animation. Um, so basically, with React, you get componentization. Because you have componentization, it's easier to test and debug. Because you have componentization, you can do fancy diffing algorithms that mean you don't have to worry about how things are rendered and when they're rendered and so on. And another thing you get is hot loading, which for visualizations is amazing because what hot loading does, now hot loading isn't purely a React thing. You have to have a few other things in your toolkit. But, hot, but React enables it because, you can, you, because the code can understand itself, sort of. That's like an oversimplification. Um, for those of you who don't, where like I say hot loading and you're drawing blanks on what that is, it basically looks like this. You're editing your file, you save your file, and the, present the, code, like the visualization in the browser changes immediately without you having to refresh the browser, without having to rerun a compile step or anything like that. All you do is you change, you change your code, browser immediately updates. Uh, what happens in the background is that your code gets recompiled because reasons, like I'm using ES6 and JSX is complicated and those things don't, maybe don't mean a lot to you, but you have a compile step that's running in the background and you don't have to think about it. And the compile step is smart enough to only recompile the part of the code that you actually changed. And then you have, uh, if you're doing everything just the right way, which is kind of hard to set up from scratch, it's better to just Google it and do whatever, everyone's, whatever everyone says you should do. Um, I mean, that's how I do configurations, right? Like, I kind of understand what's going on and I cargo call the rest. I don't know if, ever, if you do that as well. Um, but basically, it's, with hot loading, you're able to change only the parts of the code that are different in the live browser without losing variable state. So where this becomes really useful is, can, if you think about working with a data set that's like 20,000 or 30,000 data points, and it's like 10 megabytes big, and even if you have it on your local machine and you're loading it locally, you refresh the page, and it first takes three seconds to download the data set, even from your local machine. And then it takes five seconds to parse the data, and then it takes like two seconds to render. And on every reload, every time you want to change like the smallest thing in your visualization, you're losing 10 seconds of staring at a blank page. With hot loading, that doesn't happen because you're reloading the new code for that specific component that you changed. Everything else stays the same, memory stays, stays the same. You don't have to re-download the uh, data set, you don't, have to, you don't have to parse it, you don't have to, well, you do have to render it, um, but that's the fast part. And this make, this, I think this makes it a lot easier to develop especially complicated data visualizations. Um, and where it, where it also comes in handy, not just for, uh, not just for big data sets, it comes in handy where you have something that you can only test after clicking 10 times to go into a specific state. With hot loading, your code stays in that state and you can then change stuff and you don't have to do those 10 clicks every single time. And I don't know about you, but I love that. Um, so this is basically why you should even think about using React with D3. It gives you components, it gives you testing and debugging, which in my experience, D3 is terrible at. Uh, the diffing algorithms, which D3 is okay at, and hot loading, which D3 doesn't do at all. And that's 
really that's the main, that's the gist of what I was try, trying to show you is React just makes your D3 better. Um, and to learn more details about that, you can go to swiss.com slash react d3.js where I have a book and stuff and a crash course. And the whole Snapchat avatar is an experiment because I don't have any friends on Snapchat. Um, and I've been told that it's like the new Twitter and I should get into it and become more awesome. Mm, how long did I speak? Let me just check. I'm, I'm going to show you some code so that I can show you. Right, I've, I'm at 25 minutes, plenty of time. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I told you why you should use React. Now I want to show you like with direct code and live examples and I know live demos are usually a bad idea when you're on a stage, uh, but I'm going to try anyway. Uh, I'm going to show you a bit about how to actually do this stuff. So I think I can show you at most like maybe one or two examples. So what you, what you get to choose from are the space invaders that you saw. The, uh, the, there's a data visualization of a free code camp survey. Um, what else? There's a, there's a histogram of engineering salaries for immigrants. I have a particle generator that's animated and does fancy stuff. Particle generator? Okay, let's do particle generator. Which is perfect because that's the simplest one. Um, so if I go to my GitHub, I think I'm going to use the stand now. Okay. And live demos, yay. Has anyone, no has anyone noticed that um, SSL has been really slow on Macs lately? No? Okay. It always happens for me. It's like, um, yeah, maybe I will hold this after all. Uh, all right. um, what I've noticed is it takes a really, really long time to initiate the connection and then it works really fast. And I don't know why. Right, right. I've, I've actually noticed that. Every time a new phone comes out, my old phone becomes uh, like slower, noticeably slower at the same time. And I don't know if that's because I subconsciously want a new phone or because they do something to make it slower. Um, yeah, but like, why does my old phone get slow without me trying the new phone? So I don't have anything to compare it to. It just feels slower than it did like a week before. Um, let's see. Particles experiment. All right. This is what it looks like live on a website. Mm. You click and it throws out circles and there's a counter of how many circles are on the page, and that's pretty much all that this particle uh, generator does. If you have a bigger screen, you can have more pixels, you can have more particles on the page, and in my experience, it gets really, 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 really slow, around 3,000 particles. Um, it might be, there's one thing that a friend of mine always says is, you should use production version of React in, in production, it makes everything faster, which I haven't used. Question. Can you show us the, what is that notepad that you have there? Uh, paint flashing. Paint flashing. Oh, I think that's in Safari. No, it's in Chrome. It's in Chrome? Yeah, it's definitely in Chrome. Okay. Uh, timeline? I have no idea what this does. Okay. Wait, what? I'm so confused. I've never tried this before. Okay. What do you want me to do exactly?
Mm -hmm. It flashes. Right. I didn't know that existed in Chrome. I, I've seen that in Safari. So I have to go to settings. Okay. Oh, I see it. Do I have to refresh? Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Yep. Oh, no, it's not Canvas. It's SVG. I think the reason it's repainting the whole page is I didn't code it perfectly. And um, everything on the page is moving. Like, there's, there's nothing here that's not moving. <laughs> you can see that it's not repainting click or touch anywhere. And the particles part is also not repainting. You see, like, when I let go, yeah, when I let go, it only repaints that part. Um, now, I used something called Redux as the whole, the approach I used basically is the full animation approach where I have every, every detail of every component in a, data, in a, like a data structure and what I use for that data structure is Redux, um, which is kind of complicated to explain how it works if you've never used it before. But the idea is that you have almost like a global state, it's called a, I think it's called a store, that has data in it and then you call, everything calls actions directly on the store and the store updates data and then everything, re uh, everything reacts to that particular, to that data. Uh, and if I show you how example the particles get rendered, um, so components, you have, let's see what's in index. So here's what you can see, where you can see the whole um, declarativeness. You have a div, it has a header, an SVG with particles that gets particles and a footer. And that's the whole thing. And then if you look into, this is how I do the, the mouse stuff. Somebody asked earlier. <coughs> when, when mouse is down, you update mouse position. When mouse moves, you update mouse position. When mouse goes, mouse goes up, you, st you stop generating particles. And you do, and when mouse leaves the page, you also stop generating particles because I saw that is a very nice way to fill up your memory. Um, because it turns out that it's very hard to stop after it forgets that it's listening to the mouse. And then I tried doing the same stuff for touch events, but on my iPhone, at least on the full, on the old 5S, it didn't really work. Like it did not like like animating 200 SVG elements. Um, and then if you go into particles, it's a very simple component. It says particles are a grouping element that goes through a, dat a data set called particles and renders a particle for each particle. And it has properties like ID and X and Y position. And then each particle itself is a circle. And uh, that's actually about it for the particles example. Then if you look at how the data store works, that's a bit more complicated. Um, in Redux, you have something called reducers, which is, uh, I, put, I put it here. A reducer is a function that tells you how to transition, how to calculate the next state of your application from the current state based on some action. So like if you have ticker, if the action, is tr the action that's triggered is start animation, you set a flag for, start a for doing the animation and then similar for stop and start particles and then for create particles, it's a bit more complicated because it has to generate, well, it's not that complicated. What it does is it creates a new particle at the, posi at the position that you clicked on and gives it, a rand gives it a random vector of how it moves and at what speed, and then uh, puts it into the new, the new particles array, and then updates the state to 
having new particles. Um, I was experimenting with a few different ways of doing this because you can make it slower or faster. I don't think I found the fastest way, but somewhere online I read that dot and shift is a very fast way to add stuff to arrays. And it works well enough. Um, and then like every time that your game loop runs, you go through the particles and update their position with their vector. And you get a particle generator that is smart enough to only render what it needs to. Um, and that's kind of why, why I think React is so cool, because I'm not even sure I know how to do this in, D3, in pure D3. Um, and I am pretty sure I know how to go in a loop and render elements in a loop. That part is pretty easy. Um, what else can I show you? The reason it's updating the whole screen is because here's what happens. It gets, uh, I, the reason is probably that I'm doing something wrong. Um, like, there are ways that you can optimize what gets, what gets updated and what, do, what doesn't. One problem is that here you can see particles, it, the only property that the main particles thing gets is uh, an array, and arrays are always passed by reference, and you're always generate, the way Redux works, on every loop of, on every iteration of the game loop, you generate a new state, which means it has a new reference, which means React thinks that the whole component is re-rendered and needs to be refreshed. Um, I think I could use something like immutable JS or some being smarter about how, how I generate new states so that that doesn't happen. But that, I think that's why it happened in this case. And uh, if I'm brave enough, I'm gonna show you what happens when you tell it to render more particles. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this is the root. Mm. And where does that get passed in? Here you have, yeah, this is like the actual root where uh, it renders the app container and I forgot where it gets those props. Yes, what, what he said, it's in my container something something and it gets passed in by default. Uh, sorry, it's been like a few months since I did this thing and I haven't used Redux that much lately. But um, you can have like global props in React, which I've late, I was later told that I shouldn't be doing that. But React has a concept of props that you're passing in directly and some like shared shared props or almost like a shared state without it being shared state where props get passed in by default. And I'm, I think that's what I did for those. Mm, let me check. Oh. Yeah. So this example, funnily, doesn't actually do that much D3. It, um, the most of what it does of D3 is it uses it to add mouse and touch listeners for to the SVG itself. And um, I think that's almost all that all of like actual D3 in this code example. Random and random numbers, yes, because D3 is amazing at random numbers. <laughs> Wait, let me see. This props dot start ticker. Where do I define that? I'm sure I pass it in somewhere. So uh, Yeah, you're right. Containers, app container. 
Yeah. So this is where it is. It's uh, the app container, which then renders the main visu the actual visualization, um, defines a bunch of callbacks, essentially. Not essentially, they're literally callbacks. It defines callbacks, and then when it renders the app component, it passes them as um, props so that the child component knows how to trigger events on the main component. Um, I am not at all certain that this is the way it's supposed to be done because, as I said, I'm not super great at Redux yet. Ah, double colon. This is from ES7. So, question was, what's the double colon? Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that properly, so it doesn't sound funny. Um, <laughs> did, have, have you seen those groups of tweets where girls are like, oh my god, I love the smell of his col colon when he hugs me? <laughs> Yep. Uh, you can look them up if you don't know what I just said. <laughs> um, so the, the double column syntax is an ES7 thing, which is it's a, basically an ali alias for dot bind. Mm, this means this transpiles into this dot star ticker dot bind this. So the reverse animation frame that was actually well before? Yes, it does. All the, yep, um, it does work really well with re, with Redux or with React in general. Um, I don't think there's really a better way to do an animation loop, unless you're using like actual D3 transitions for simple stuff. And I'm also not entirely certain that people who designed React React would like me doing this this way but it works really well when you put it in samples. Um, and it's literally, it's just a way to only update the data state on uh, an animation, on what React Animation Frame does, Request Animation Frame does, because then you get smoother animations and stuff. I think there's like a really complicated reason behind why you should use that, but it's a really good idea if you use it. Uh, I don't know if it's a polyfill for all the browsers, but pr pr there probably is. I don't know. It's also been around for a really, really long time. So it's um, like browsers have really caught up with standards when you look at it. I think request animation frame works almost anywhere that your users are actually going to use. Cool. More questions? Uh, I was going to show you what happens when we increase how many particles we have, right? Does, any, does everyone actually want to see that? Sure. Okay. Let's see if this still runs. Has anyone had problems with like bitrot in JavaScript projects where it, it works and then you try to run it again six months later and nothing works? Um, I've had that a lot. Okay. Um, oh, another cool thing is you get this amazing uh, React DevTools thingy, which means you can look exactly at how your app is structured and which props are going into it, which is very, again, very useful for the whole debugging part of why React is great. See, they show up here and you can see exactly what they are. And it becomes slower when you're inspecting the application, of course but then they go away. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll zoom in once I open a file. Particles. Okay, so how do I do this? Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be brave and I'm gonna tell it to generate a thousand particles on every click. Okay, now if I refresh. <laughs> it's a bit slower. 
um, and it also generated 2,000 of them, not 1,000. I think it's because my click lasted for longer than a 60th of a millisecond. So if I hold this, Um, the browser is going to crash if I try to inspect these elements. <laughs> um, actually, I was once working on a visualization of a UFO data set with something like 100,000 data points, and I accidentally uh, did a console log of the array. <laughs> um, but funnily, that does actually work when you're, if you're trying to parse a large data set, you can actually do it in your browser and then instead of printing it, you can create a file download on the front end, and you can get a parsed CSV without having to worry about like the terminal or something. You can do it with, because D3 is really good at parsing and loading CSVs. Even if you have a really huge CSV and you want to parse it and create something new, you can create like a file download that runs fully on the front end. Question. Right. I think uh, I think um, a lot of the slowness is also going to be uh, the computation because I'm generating an entire new copy of the of the whole data set on every iteration of the game loop, which is like not a good idea. Um, and as I mentioned, one way to that you can fix that is by using immutable JS or like proper immutable data structures whereas I'm naively using normal arrays. Let's see, how do I do this? While you're doing that, as an aside, I just wanted to add the um, request animation frame. Um, I think D3 Timer actually implements that. Yes. Um, and it actually, I think, makes sure that it's working well across all browsers, and that's actually also what D3 transitions use under the hood. So I think D3 Timer is also Exactly. D3 Timer does use request animation frame in the background. What it doesn't do is, once you get a lot of frame drops, it becomes a good idea to calculate the actual time it took from one frame to another, so that you can essentially render multiple frames per loop, um, because otherwise you get a lag in your animation. So what I could have done here is, uh, I could have taken into account the actual time it, it took from one frame to the next, and then you would get a choppier animation, but the time span it took, it took to animate 10,000 particles would be the same as otherwise. And then it depends on whether that's useful or not. So, the scripting, so the rendering only took this much. I guess, not actually, I haven't actually looked at these graphs that much yet. I think this means that the data manipulation took the most time. Yeah. All the same graph? You have to, you have to use seconds, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, the, the rasterization is really fast. Those three parts at the very bottom is mm -hmm. the rasterization. Okay. So making an entire copy of the whole array was a bad idea. Uh, which is very predictable when you think about it. Mm. But I think what I can also do is, let's see if I can make like a production build of this. and then it should be a bit faster. And hopefully this actually works because I don't think I've actually run the production build on this piece, on this thing ever. Mm, but the difference is that with Webpack you can have different configurations for your dev environment and for your production environment. And the production environment takes out a lot of things that help you as a developer, but it also makes your code faster.
see if this works. No. Well, I'm sure we'll do that. I'm sure we can do this. The reason I'm not doing NPM start now and I'm going this way is that I was hoping it would work. Oh, fuck, I forgot to. Okay, give me a second. Um, there's a bug in this version of Webpack that they aren't fixing where some configuration has to be manually changed when you do a production build and it's to disable hot, hot loading. Uh, I've tried doing it automatically, but I've never gotten it to work. And then I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm just going to remove that part of the conf configuration every time I compile. OK, so one way to do it is to move the automatic configuration into the actual Webpack file instead of having the Babel RC file. OK, let's see if this works better now. Oh crap, I accidentally moved the mouse as well. <laughs> um, I can't really tell if it's better or not. Yeah. But as we saw, the problem isn't actually how fast React is at, l at rendering thousands of SVG nodes. The problem is copying an array of 10,000 elements 60 times a second. Um, and I also have a laptop from 2012, which probably doesn't help. <laughs> but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's also one of the, like, the main lesson I learned while playing around with animations in React is the best optimization is to remove elements that you can't see. So like, on my first implementation of this, I wasn't removing nodes uh, particles when they reach the bottom of the screen, and that was a bad idea. Um, and like a lot of times when you're, especially when you're dealing with a lot of elements, what you find is that you can't actually fit those many el that many elements onto the screen, so it makes no sense to keep animating them. It's easier to make some simple calculations and like remove a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, more questions? In this example, you're not using very much of T3 at all, um, you, you said. So which bits of T3 are worth keeping? I guess React is replacing all of the data-driven document parts of T3, and you're using, using the rest of T3. So the question was, what are you actually using, what are you still using of D3 when React is doing a good job of the data-driven part? So what I use of D3 are all the all the stuff that calculates that data. Um, basi the basic approach I use is I use D3 to calculate the props that I then feed into React so that React can do the rendering because I don't want to calculate how to do a pie chart manually. I don't want to histogram my data. I don't want to deal with creating a tree hierarchy out of linear data uh, like st or stack diagrams or literally D3 has a lot of helpers just for calculating properties that you then feed into like even path. Um, there are a lot of shapes, especially in D3v4, a lot of shapes which just calculate the D, the D attribute of path, of basic path elements. And you can still use D3 for that. The only thing I don't use D3 for is manipulating the actual DOM. Unless in special instances where I am doing exactly that. Um, there's one thing you can do that I called like the black box approach, where you can take any D3 visualization and you essentially just wrap it in a React component so that it fits with your other stuff. And then in a special lifecycle event that happens after your component is rendered on the screen, you then use D3 to select that component and render a purely D3 visualization into it. And that works really well too. Um, I use it specifically for axes a lot. But like if I had to quickly test out a visualization I found online, that would be an approach I use. Um, the problem there is that as soon as you break the, as soon as you reach the layer of this is what D3, where D3 is handling the DOM, you lose most of the benefits of React because you're, on every render you have to throw away the whole thing and re-render it again with D3. 
uh, and you don't have the diffing algorithms and all of that. But it's really useful if you have an otherwise React environment and you don't want to re-implement something in React, you can just wrap a D3 visualization into React. And then you can also use a hybrid approach, but the main, thing, the main way I do it is I use D3 to calculate the props, uh, which is, and it's really great that D3 V4 is moving in a direction where you can load only the parts of D3 that you're actually using. You no longer have to load the entire thing. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. More questions in the back? Between version three and version four, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sense of what's missing. And are there any gotchas between versions for React? Um, so the go question was, are there any key differences between D3v3 and D3v4 that impact how you would use it with React? And so far I haven't found any. Most of the stuff I've been using with D3 has just moved to be named differently. Um, like the API is cleaned up, there's no more, D3 layouts no longer exist, they're now just shapes, different shapes that come with D3 natively. Uh, one big omission is that D3v4 still doesn't have maps, I think, but I'm assuming they're gonna fix that before they release a final version. Um, but yeah, mostly there hasn't been, haven't really found any particularly missing things. Uh, there's even one thing that's a lot better in the new D3 is like when you're doing transitions, with D3v4 you can predefine a transition so that you can make sure that all elements are using the same core transition when, you're, when they're doing a thing. And what that gives you is that they're all synced. They all start this animating at the same time. They all finish animating at the same time. And I think you couldn't do that with D3v3. I don't know exactly why, but you can now. More questions? Do you have the letter example? The what example? example? The alphabet example? Yes. Okay. And I assume you want to look, look at it with the paint render thingy? Yes, sorry. I do. Okay. So <laughs> this is the alphabet example where every letter is essentially transitioning itself the parent container doesn't know that transitions are happening or has no concept of what's going on. It just renders a list of letters. And how did we implement that again? Go here and more tools, render settings. There you go. And you can see that it's literally not touching anything that doesn't move even though you are naive, when you're rendering the alphabet, you're just looping through letters and then React handles the rest. Mm, like alphabet component looks like this. Um, for some reason, GitHub still doesn't have syntax highlighting for JSX, or I'm not telling it correctly to use that, but this is, this is literally the entire alphabet. It, hmm? yep, the letter component looks like this. It's a bit more complicated because it has to do transitions. So what it does is on component will enter, can you, oh, you can see it pretty well actually. On component will enter, you select the, actually let's go from the render part. The render part renders a text and it's just text with some positioning and the value. Uh, this could have been named better, I assume. It could have been named a lot better. Um, but it's rendering a text node with a letter in it. And then in component will enter. This is a call, a lifecycle event that happens when the component is being entered into the DOM but isn't there yet. You select the component, select the DOM node directly with D3. Uh, set your state to, actually I'm not gonna explain that, that's complicated. Basically, instead of rendering the component from props, I'm rendering it from state so that I have more control over when the, those things happen. And then it's a normal node transition. 
you're, you're transitioning the Y element and the fill opacity. And when the transition is done, you update your state to say, this is basically how I can sync what D3 thinks is true about the component and what React thinks is true, and then call the callback so that React knows, oh, hey, this letter is now inserted. When it's leaving, it's, the callback is even more important than when the component is leaving. This happens when React says, I'm going to remove this component out of the page. I can do a transition and then say, OK, now you can actually remove it, and it goes away. And component will receive props is essentially the update part, where if your position changes, do the whole transition thing to move to the new position. And this is where uh, state becomes important, because otherwise you get them jumping around. And the result is this, where the only thing that gets rendered is the thing that's actually changing, even though you're naively just rendering everything. Question? Do we know what the callback actually does? Um, no, yeah. Like React has, these are like extra lifecycle events uh, that you enable by saying this stuff is going to have transitions. And then React does some stuff in the background. So because otherwise, what happens is it immediately removes the node, and you don't have time to transition it, or it immediately inserts it. And actually, the only problem is when it's taking it out. When you're when it's being entered, you always have time to transition it. When it's being updated, you also always have time. When it's being removed, you need these callbacks. Uh, the problem is this stops working at about 600 nodes. In my experience, React Transition Group, I don't know why it's slower or what exactly makes it slow, because I haven't looked at the source. But you don't want to have more than a few hundred elements in the same transition group. You can have multiple elements on screen in separate transition groups, and that works well. But each transition group has to be, I think, smaller than about 500 in my experiments. OK. More questions in the back? Um, I can show you what happens if you don't call the callback. If you call, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what happens if you call the callback immediately before you do the transition, because that's the same as not having it. So we go to the letter, and before leave, instead of calling the callback when the, compo the component leaves, or when we're done transitioning, I'm going to call it immediately. <coughs> and now what should happen is that we don't get a transition when they leave the page, but they just kind of vanish immediately if it works. OK. See? There's no transition for letters going out. They immediately get removed from the DOM, so there's nothing to transition. And that's why the callbacks are important, because it can tell React, hey, hold on, I have something to do before you remove this DOM node from the DOM. Did that answer the question? Yeah, okay. I appreciate it. More questions? Okay. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself, when do you only use D3? When do you like abandon um, it? It's a good question. I think it really depends on a case, case by case basis. Um, one thing I'm currently experimenting with is figuring out how to get Canvas, React, and D3 to play nicely together. And I haven't really found a good way yet. Um, just because Canvas isn't DOM-based, so it doesn't have nodes and components. So it, that's kind of hard. React Canvas doesn't work with, Re with React 15. It only works with React 14. 
and if you try to compile it, it gives you very nasty warnings and nothing works, unfortunately. Uh, I've had some suggestions to use things called React Motion and a few others, but I haven't tried them yet. Uh, there's also React Art, which is supposed to be specifically designed for Canvas, but I, have, I, I haven't played with it yet. Um, like one of the, I think the, the key, the key uh, argument between when you, drop when you drop React and go into pure D3 is when you have something that's already implemented in D3 and it would be annoying or pointless to re-implement it in React. That's what, like axes are, axes are a good example because React, a D3 comes with them, they work really well and dealing with rendering those lines and labels and all of that just the right way is pointless when you can just do d3.axis, axis. I don't know how to pronounce that, wow. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis and on whether I already have some code or not. More questions? Yeah, I have one more for this. Um, you mentioned briefly that you could get all of these animations in sync. Is that what React Transition Group is doing? Mm. React Transition Group pretty much just gives you those extra lifecycle methods. What's doing it is uh, this. Where do I do it? Um, I don't remember where it is right now, but if you define a transition as a, by saying like var t equals d3 dot transition with some parameters, it becomes a, in d3 v4 that becomes a stored transition so then when you do node.transition, you can pass a stored transition as an argument and they all ha use the same timer. So if you pass it to multiple elements, to multiple transitioning elements, they all use the same underlying transition to do their stuff, which automatically puts them in sync. Um, that, may, that would make sense. Yes. So here I define transition as, a object, as an object property for each letter and then pass it in when I do no dot transition. Um, technically I'm doing it incorrect here and it doesn't actually work that well because if it's an object property, you get a new object every time so they're all using their own transition. But the intention is there. Um, and Mike Bostock actually tweeted at me and said that I'm doing something wrong and then misunderstanding how this should be used. But, uh, oh no, I know what he, you can't, you shouldn't use this uh, stored transition as a way to share transition proper, to like predefine transitions and then just share the properties. Like if you want to have 50 elements that have a 750 millisecond d d transition with some easing, you should, you, you should redefine a transition every time. If you want to have 50 elements that are exactly in sync, then you should use a stored transition and pass it to all of them. Yeah. More questions? Cool. Then I think that's it for me.